the southwestern United States. Diversity in close proximity. Suffocating barren deserts not far from dense, endless forests. Blazing heat and frigid cold. These are the lands of legends and dinosaur bones, of Native American magic and myth. These are lands where superstition comes alive at night by the light of a fire, and where fleeting shadows in the dark are always best avoided. Legends of Bigfoot are alive on this part of the country, just like anywhere else with this many mysterious miles of forest. We journey to Apache country to hear new accounts firsthand from reliable sources. We scout the land and visit the sites. Is Bigfoot alive and well in the Southwest? Native American lore speaks of accomplished shamans, men of magic who have perfected their practice and can move between worlds. They wield frightful powers and the ability to shapeshift into the form of their animal totems. Are they simply creatures of lore, or are they something real, something akin to other legends, such as werewolves? Rarely are these man-creatures spoken of outside of the secret realm of the tribe, but in a world exclusive, we see inside the magic, inside the practice, and we hear first-hand accounts of the horror and motive behind the phantasms quietly and fearfully called the Skinwalkers. What about other creatures that may exist in these deserts and mountains? Some say certain dinosaurs never went extinct. Some speak of giant snakes and other mysterious anomalies yet to be found. Some say that giant birds still spread shadows across nighttime landscapes. Could there be creatures like these and more that have eluded human detection? And if all of these mysteries turn out to have a basis in truth, could the overall answer be so profound that it shakes our very perception of reality. And what if it does? This is the oldest known photograph of Bigfoot. Tales of a mysterious ape-like creature prevail throughout the world. But could such a creature really exist, so long escaping the single shred of irrefutable proof? If so, does a variation of the legendary creature prowl the backlands of the Southwest? Some say yes they do. Our journeys begin in the Four Corners region of the United States, near a small speck on the map called Dulce, New Mexico. Hoyt Velarde is a retired law enforcement officer in the area. His reputation is impeccable, his background impressive, and his stories of Bigfoot encounters detailed and frightening. I got into law enforcement uh, really early in my life. I uh, worked through the ranks, sergeant, lieutenant. I spent uh, 32 years doing that. I finished up being the executive director, Department of Public Safety. Finished that up. And one day I, just, I decided that was, it's over, that's enough. 32 years, I. I left the department and I went out into the oil fields. I'm working out in the oil fields now. 
six days a week. So basically driving every day. One of my most uh, exciting uh, encounters that I've had, I was working on a fence. I've got a, I've got a ranch out here. I've got a 10 foot high electric fence. I'm working, I have to, this fence has to be checked maybe every other day because it's electricity you know, run by solar panels and whatnot. I go out there, physically have to tra travel the whole fence so it won't short out. Uh, there's a small, narrow place in the fence where I have to walk. And I got off the four-wheeler, I walked about maybe 20 yards. I'm looking at the fence, looking up and down, up there and down, go to the next pole, look up and down. And I come over to a small rise in about maybe 30, 35 feet from me stood this creature that was huge. <laughs> and my fence, like I said, is 10 feet high. This thing's standing there like this, downwards, touching the top lines. And <laughs> this thing is at least five feet or maybe more over that fence because he was reaching down. The top four lines are dead. The six bottom ones are live. Live meaning it's got electric current in it. He was testing it from the top down like this. <clears throat> but that's what he was doing. And I came up on, I, I was just walking. All of a sudden, there he was. We were face to face. All I had in my hand was a, a hammer. <laughs> A hammer and some plastic insulators on my other hand. I saw this thing standing there and I, I just went numb. I didn't know what it was. We looked at each other, I saw his eyes, his face. Everything we looked at each other real good. And well, when he first, I saw him and I just stopped. I stopped moving. But this thing, when it, when it saw me, he sort of made that stance like that. There was a stance he took, and he was surprised that I was there. And we're face to face, and this thing sort of wanted to move back or forward. It sort of made that motion. And uh, he had his hand on the fence. He was on the inside of the fence, and I was on the inside of the fence. And if a human being is going to climb through a fence, he'll pull you down and step through and do that. I shut the fence down. I shut the current off so that I could work on it. Well, this thing was testing it, I guess. And when he saw, we looked at each other for approximately 10 seconds. Then, he, then it moved, grabbed the fence, and just pulled it down and threw himself through it real quick. <clears throat> he was on the ground on the opposite side. I was still frozen. I was so scared. I was shaking. I, I didn't realize I was shaking or anything, but uh, this thing was all of a sudden he just took off running about 20 or 30 yards next to the brush line. He, he sort of went into the brush and stood there looking at me. When I sort of came to my senses, I was scared. I was really scared. I didn't know what it was or anything. And then, <laughs> Finally, I came, I came back to, and I took off running, ran back to my four wheeler, jumped on it, and all it does, all I had to do is press a little button to start that four wheeler. I could not press that button. I finally pressed it, it started, and it was already in gear. You just press that thing and give it some gas and you're gone. I did that, I drove straight through the brush out in the middle of big fields that we got. We got off of fields out there, so. I drove out approximately center and I stopped. I was so scared, I looked back and I, I was just shaking. I, at that time, I realized that my legs were shaking. I was shaking, I was breathing. My breathing was really erratic. And I was scared. That's what you boil down to. I sensed fear in his eyes because 
I was frozen. I couldn't move. I couldn't, you know, I was, I just couldn't move. I was, my eyes were wide open and I was watching him right in the face and he had hesitant, he had hesitant moves. Like he wanted to take off this, oh, this way or he had that, I'm saying he, I don't know if it's a he or she, but this thing, he just moved back and forth. Like if he wanted to take off, he wanted to run, it, it stopped several times and finally it made a move through the fence. The photos you see are obviously recreations of the event, but the location they were filmed is exactly where Hoyt had the actual encounter. Author and explorer David Hatcher Childress of Adventures Unlimited Press has a long history of looking for Bigfoot and similar creatures all over the world. He joined us in Apache country to explore Hoyt's ranch and the surrounding land. I've been looking for Bigfoot and investigating Bigfoot stories and Yeti stories for years. In fact, I've traveled all over the world, to the Himalayas, to Mongolia, to the Pacific Northwest, all in trying to find real footage, real cases of Bigfoot. And I was pleased to meet in Dulce, New Mexico, Sheriff Hoyt Velarde, who's a sheriff with the Hakaria Apache Indian Reservation up there. Hoyt claims that he has investigated over a hundred Bigfoot sightings around northern New Mexico. I was very fortunate that he took me up to his remote ranch to show me exactly where he had come face to face with Bigfoot. So I come, I drive right up the fence line here and I parked my four wheeler right behind this tree. I came through there and parked it there and I went back down the fence that way, checked it. I figured I'll go to the top of the hill this way to check the fence. And I walked up this path, and I'll show you where the exact spot where I saw him. Okay. So here's this little rise right here that I was telling you about. I walked from down there, walked up this way. I come up to this rise and some of this brush is a little higher but just you know I must have been right about here I looked up and I saw him standing right over there on this side of the fence yeah okay I'll show you where that's at see if you were standing down there you can't I see you can't see that thing but is. he was so he was so tall he was like as tall as this oh, he's taller than that as he is reaching down, about nothing to this line right here, he's testing it like this. Because it was alive and no. it didn't, it wasn't alive. I shut okay. it off in order for me to check it. To check it, so he was trying to get through and testing mm -hmm. it himself. Wow, okay. And you were standing over there and he was there kind of yeah, right, checking right like, uh-huh. And, and all of a sudden, because he saw me, he sort of, you know, now it's frozen right there. And, and he was taller, He's taller than, that. than oh, this. Yes. Okay, that's, that's eight feet tall or even nine. Uh, wow, so this thing was like at least nine feet tall. Man, and what color was he? Just sort of a real dark brown to black. Then he, then he moved. He moved down here. He moved to right here. And he just grabbed this. Like that. And just kind of dove through the no, fence. No, he didn't dive through. He stepped through. He just stepped through. And yeah, just he, like a human he, would, really. He bent down. Yeah, to bend down like, like a person. And then <laughs> yeah. just went on the other side. Yeah, and then he just, did he run up the hill? Yeah, he bolted to this. Right over there. And then the two of you just looked at each other and then, then he kept going. He stopped I, I, for a minute. Or you wanted, did you run I too? was gone. You for, you left the, you went the other way then. Yeah, I don't know where he went. <laughs> okay. He could have been behind me, I don't know. Okay. I jumped on my four wheeler, went through this opening and drove out to that flat back there. Uh -huh. Just okay, get away from the trees mm -hmm. and then you just stop for a minute, huh? Yeah. And what year was that then? Oh, about 2000. One or two, 2,000, I think it was right at 2,000. 
the year 2000 in the or, in the summer or kind of spring? Well, we're checking the fences for spring. Uh, it was the springtime. About May, I guess. Yeah, about May. May of 2000. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. And you leave the fences off in the in the winter time. Yeah. You? Okay. And then in the summer you're going to turn it back on. Yeah. Uh -huh. See, an elk come over here. They'll just tear it up from you. And it's real easy. Like if we just pull this one. I've um, encountered a lot since. Uh, we had a camp up at my ranch some years back, and that's where we weren't exactly looking for, to see anything. We were looking for evidence. As all those camps do, we look for evidence, tracks, scuts, everything, anything we could find. And uh, during the course of that time, it was gonna rain. We're at the ranch, ready to settle in for the night. And uh, late evening, it's getting ready to rain. These guys wanted to go see the ruins. Let's go see the ruins. We've never seen the ruins. So I said, okay, we'll go see the ruins. And I jumped into a Suburban with uh, several others. We took off to see the ruins. I took these uh, party, those three vehicles. We parked our cars, we had to walk up the trail a ways to get to the ruins. I sat there, I was the last one. I said, well, walk up this trail and you'll see a ladder leaning against the rocks. Go up there, that's where the ruins are. So everybody goes up there and I'm sitting there and I realize, hey, wait a minute, I'm sitting down here by myself. I better get up there. So I made my way up there real slow. I was really tired at the end of the day. I walk up there. We took in the sights. We're coming back down. There was a couple, young man and a young girl walking in front of us. <clears throat> About 20 yards in front of us, and there was another group behind us, and then we're sort of strung out. And all of a sudden, this gal screams and says, Look, look. She points into the brush, and uh, she was just ecstatic. We ran down there. There's three of us walking behind them. We ran down there. And immediately that smell hit me. You could, you could smell that I looked in that one direction to leave the, the branches were still moving. The smell like a real thick, musky type smell. It's, it's, it like feels, oh, wet dog hair. You know, it, and not, not a clean dog either, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, it smells bad. There's just a bad odor to it. And this gentleman that I was with, he uh, ran up after it. And I thought, hey, wait a minute, he's going by himself. So I took off after him. And it, it had rained already, but you know, if it rains any further, any more, you know, the roads really get bad. So the the ground was wet, the vegetation was wet, thorns, stickers, everything else. We ran through that, ran up on the hill, and I got I got behind right there, and this other gentleman was further up ahead, and he was yelling at me, he said, come on up here, come on up here. I'm trying to get up there. About that time, uh, this oak, oak tree just snapped. I mean, it literally snapped. I say it's about three, four inches diameter. That thing just snapped. We went there later on and looked at that. <laughs> that, uh, not that day, but about a week later, went back up through that same spot and see that oak tree snapped. And it was, it was loud enough everybody could hear it. And we got away from the vehicles and we said, wait a minute, we better get back to the vehicles. It's only two of us up here, and we weren't exactly together. We're yelling back in the forest, so we got out of there. Trees about that big. And it flipped over on us. 
So Hoyt, you were you were coming here on a on a Bigfoot expedition, right? Trying to find Bigfoot. Was that it? Well, evidence. Evidence, uh-huh. And then and what where you came up here and then uh, Bigfoot started throwing rocks at you? Is that what no, you're saying? No, no. One of the gentlemen got hit in the back with a rock. A little wasn't a big rock, you know. Fairly small. You were right. Right between the that pine tree and this pine tree right there. So like you're saying a Bigfoot was up here throwing a rock down. Is that it? I mean I don't know where the rock came from. Or Somebody did something throw a rock. He walked up there, the rest of us walked on this side. You just take it away, uh, just tell us that again. Just we'll, we'll get it on camera if we can. So, what happened then? Well, uh, we're, there's four of us walking up this side of the tree. And uh, this younger gentleman, he went back on the trail on that side. From that tree over there, walked around, came through here. And he was walking right about here, where I left the marker. He was hitting the back up here up high. And we were right about there. And we heard it. Oh! <laughs> Boom, we in action. <laughs> <laughs> and he flipped around and sort of ran like this, looking up. He said, What was that? And he said, Well, there's a. So I got hit with something. So we started looking around. And we found the rock. And the only kind of rock is from up in that area. So. We, one of the guys ran up on that side, <laughs> on this side, we didn't see nothing. And you didn't hear something running through the we bush? Didn't see, we, didn't, we didn't hear anything, didn't see anything, but we definitely uh, came in contact with something here. Not very many creatures of the forest can throw rocks. That's for sure. And so that's what, is this the yeah, that, actual I, marker? Yeah. I put this there just to... We walked all over these rocks up on top, we were looking for any type of evidence, especially scat, your, uh, you know, yeah. everything. We right, just, right. Yeah, sure. We're looking for that, crawling through the brush and whatnot. And it, these rocks go all the way to the back, back up in the canyon there. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, in like the Yeti, they that stories of Yetis killing yaks. Uh, I mean, they'll. I mean, they'll break their neck, they'll grab up a, a yak, and the yak is a cow, and, and they're big too, and they just break their neck. And, you know, I mean, you know, this is a famous story in, the, in Nepal and Himalayas. So, so this, uh, th this is the place. Well, so you, your suspicion was then that, uh, that uh, some Bigfoot or big family of Bigfoot or is, was somewhere living up here, up in well, this canyon. It's, they probably passed through here and passed through this canyon and in doing so they probably left some type of evidence because uh, in the past I've gotten reports of people being up at those rocks up on top seeing something walk across the flat down here in uh, proximity to my place back here it's real close. Are there people setting wildlife cameras out here? I do. do you? I haven't gotten anything. That dang wind really misses it. It looks kind of like some troglodyte lair here. <laughs> Is that right there? That says Fred Flintstone all the way. <laughs>
being up there at Hoyt's ranch and, and seeing him along his fence uh, was so cool. Uh, Hoyt's a great guy. I, I trust him a lot, and it, to me it says a lot that a, a, a sheriff and a Native American would, would share this story with us in, 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 in total seriousness. And I believe him. Up at his ranch, it was clearly a remote area. Uh, there's very few roads around there. Hoyt took us up there in a four-wheel drive. Uh, this, to me, was Bigfoot country. These people here are pretty open about it. They're just as curious as everybody else. We want to know. We want to know attitude. There's a lot of people that walk these mountains, especially during the spring, like right now, March and April. Everybody's out there and their grandmothers. It's just an outing. They do that and they run into things. J.C. Johnson is a paranormal investigator from the region as well. He has spent many hours in the backwoods and has insights and theories that are as unique as they are unsettling. Well, basically, um, I've been an outdoor guide off and on for about 20 years, and uh, we had some really strange things happen. It's when we came to the Four Corners area and we started a river business uh, on the lesser known sections of the San Juan River that we started encountering very strange things, typically upright, hairy, hominid, large, smelly, scary, ugly, ape-looking things. Probably the first real sighting we had was in 2003, and we were still exploring some of these sections of the river. And we put a, a vehicle in to drop our boat so we could go down and do the 17-mile section. We had a truck waiting at the other end to load our boats in, come back to the vehicle we left in, and leave. And it was up by a sheep corral. The lead truck was in front of me. I was on the walkie-talkie with him, and I, just as I would let the button off talking to my partner, my ex-wife was in the truck with him, and I heard a blood-curdling scream. And I called back, what happened? What's going on? And it's choppy and bumpy, and they started hauling butt, and they left me in the dust, told me to look up by the sheep corral. There was a scary man up there, a scary, hairy man. My Navajo ex-wife was screaming, and she probably didn't know what it was. And the genre of the skinwalker and all these other things all kind of roll into one. When I came up on it, I hit it with my high beams and it was walking off away from me. And it started swinging its arms like this, up over the ridge, gone. So it wasn't until I started doing some real serious research online that I figured out these things are out here. This is not a Pacific Northwest deal. These things are around here, and then especially the Chuscas, the Lucachuca, and the Carrizos, um, that's the areas we investigate. But it all goes back to what happened to us on the river. Uh, these things came into our camps. I had paying people. They pay me to go on vacation with them. We're, you know, I'm in charge of their safety and on the water, on the land. And I've got something that I can't explain harassing my camp and my customers, my people. And that's when, you know, we had a couple of horrific experiences down there. Seeing the landscape and the remoteness of the land, it becomes easy to understand why something unknown might remain undetected, despite our best efforts and even our best technology. J.C. married into the tribe in Native American country, and over the years he has gained a unique perspective on another Native American legend, the Skinwalkers. It's not that I ever wanted to tackle a Skinwalker genre. I never did. Um, that's completely evil. It's kind of something, the more I found out about it, having been married Navajo for 20 years, the more I found out, the more evil I wanted to expose. I don't want to glorify this particular dark practice that is rampant on the reservation right now. I want to expose it for what it is. My crew and those involved who are Native American, they believe that homicide 
Cannibalism, child abuse, and necrophilia don't have a place in any society, and that's what's going on presently. And that's what we're going to make people aware of. The general overview of a skinwalker, and this is in brief, um, number one, you want to join up. Uh, you need to take one of your family members, someone as near and dear to you, and kill them, sacrifice them. You bring the body in, you feast on some of the body parts, the softer tissues. They're after they make powders, potions out of the body that you've brought in. At this point, you start to study, become an understudy with a shaman or whatever they call themselves, and your life is no longer yours. You belong to them. Your family will either turn and become part of what you're doing, or they'll be sacrificed also, eventually. It's an ugly, ugly thing. But there's different things. There's people so angry that they want that power to get even with somebody. There are people that will go, so to speak, to the dark side to get that power. Early on, you apprentice, you put on the height of the animal you're trying to emulate. Later, as you become more informed or more filled with evil, you actually do transform 90% into this animal, a coyote, a cougar, an elk. Typically, thing, typically, yeah, it, it's a wolfen, the wolfen type dog man is 90% of what I come across, 90% of what I investigate. The red or yellow glowing eyes, no outside light source, they glow independently like little Bic lighters or whatever, lasers. But, you know, 90% of what we come across is the wolfen type experiences. Basically, that's what I've been investigating is werewolves, plain and simple. Um, the appearance, everything, um, the, the snout, the ears, the eyes, the teeth, the, I mean, I've had some horrific, horrific reports from people. Once you sign up for that type of degradation, I, I think it's fairly widespread. It's obviously something that anyone can do, whether it be Caucasian, Native American, what have you. Um, this particular brand of evil is something you can sign up for and become one of these creatures. There's occasions where they come and they knock on the door. Like a vampire, you've got to let them in. If you don't, they'll dance on your roof, they'll bang on your windows, they'll bang on your door. Some of these things are eight foot tall plus. If they want to take that door down, they can take that door down. They can come in and do whatever they want physically to you, but there's something spiritual that keeps them outside. Medicine men used to practice good medicine. Now we go to the res, and i am got a pocket full of cash because I'm, I'm sick, and he's gonna tell me somebody put a curse on me. And it's probably the medicine man himself who put the curse on me, and I'm paying him to take away the curse. Yeah, I've, I've got this curse on me, I know I've got this curse on me, I need to go see a medicine man, get this curse lifted from me. Uh, he may well be the one who put the curse on you in the first place, but you pay him to get rid of it. There is not really good herbal medicine being practiced anymore. Typically, with the skinwalker and, and the people I've interviewed, especially, they'll blow a powder in your face, and then they'll they'll tell you what they're going to do you right then and there. Um, one lady, the guy jumped out, grabbed the reins of her horse, she fell off, poof, powder in her face. Says, "You're cursed. I'm going to ruin you and your family." And it happened. Now, the power of suggestion is there too, and I see a lot of that. There, there's uh, instances where we have investigated uh, people who've probably died of fright, entirely died of fright. Um, they, the ones that transform, we've got the three kinds. You've got the ones that wear the hide to emulate, the ones who transform, the ones who travel spiritually. Those are the most dangerous, are the ones who travel spiritually because they can come in, stop your heart. They can come in, call you in pipe. They can come in, do bad things to you. Those are the worst kind. It, they, and they do kill people all the time, all the time. To help us separate legend from truth, powers from myth, we are lucky enough to have a genuine Native American shaman who will go unnamed. He is about to share with you information that has never been revealed in the mainstream. Some things are rarely spoken of, 
even on the land of the reservation and among its peoples. But now, in a world exclusive, we go inside the shadowy world of the Skinwalker. There was no anger, there was no hate, there was no war in the beginning. There was only happiness and life and the cycles of life, the four seasons of life, the four seasons of man, the four colors of man. The four colors of man each have their own beings, their own representatives, the own beings that represent them as spirits. Each color of man from each direction, the yellow from the east, the black from the south, the red from the west, and the white from the north. These four colors of man were once together. They once each lived together. They helped each other. They each learned different teachings from one another. From the beginning of time, the human beings walked amongst the animals, walked amongst the spirits of the land. From the beginning of time, these beings have been here on this earth. They have been alive from the beginning. The way the elders became these beings is through ceremonies, through fasting, through using certain tools to become these animals as spirit beings, to be able to travel, to be able to heal. From the beginning, these beings were looked upon as healers to help and guide the people. They were not looked as evil. They were not looked upon as bad human beings or bad spirits. They were not called skinwalkers. It takes a lifetime to be able to learn these things, to be able to understand them and use them in the right way. It takes a lifetime it takes a family bloodline to be handed down from generation to generation to be able to understand these ways. These teachings are meant to help and heal people, but in the recent centuries, they have turned into evil doings. They have turned into evil rituals. So today, when one thinks of a skinwalker, they think of evil. They think of somebody crawling on their roof or scratching on the window at night. They think of sorcery and witchcraft when they think of skinwalkers. These paths, you do, you do not choose this path to become a being. You are given a life. This life is handed to you from the day you are born. And you must journey this path. You are taught as a child, you are taught as a young man, you are taught as an adult that this is the life that has been chosen for you. If you do not want this, then you must live as a regular mortal human being. These teachings can carry your life and prolong your life for a long time. There are certain things in ways that you must practice to be be able to transform into these beings. One of the most strongest and one of the most hardest things that you must do to become these beings of sorcery and witchcraft is you must take the life of a fur of a family person. You must take the life of a family person that you love the most, the one that you have the love for the most in your family. You must take the life of this person. In doing so, you must take their soul. And you use their soul and their life to give you power and strength into the other world. But if you do not follow these ways and you do not do what is called of you, 
you'll become an old man at a young age. If you do not do certain things, certain life, certain health issues will arise and you will become sick. You will be, become unable to function as a well-being. If your animal has a hurt on his physical body, you shall carry that physical ailment also. And these teachings have become a sorcery as witchcraft to use against another human being. Rather than to help them, they use these teachings to tear apart the families, to take wives, to take children, to take the health, to take the wealth of another family, they use these ways as sorcery and witchcraft to take another human being's life to gain more power, they would do this. Once they start becoming weak, they must take another life to become stronger again. If they do not take another life, then they become old and weak. And they become vulnerable to the other sorcerers of witchcraft which can then take their life and their power and their strength as a young adult when I was growing up I had a lot of friends and a lot of relatives that I used to associate with the whole time not knowing that I was being taught certain things until I reached a certain age then these ways were revealed to me as teachings you must be able to travel long distances you must be able to go days and nights without eating and sleeping you must also do one thing which I could not do. There were certain gatherings in the dream world. They seemed to have been dreams at one time until I realized that they were not dreams. They were my life. They were my life during the night when I traveled to the gatherings. We sat the dark rooms together. They came all the way to the part of becoming. And I was told that for me to become the being that I must take the life of my sister. When I was told that I must take the life of my sister, I become angry and I knew that I could not do this. So in that turn, they turned against me and they used their witchcraft against me. They tried to hurt me, they tried to confuse me. They tried to make me think that I was going crazy in a sense. That all that I had learned and all that I had been taught was a dream, was not reality. They tried to make me think these ways, but I knew that these ways were real. So out of that cause, I then turned against them, and I knew that when I made that decision, that I would have to carry this for the rest of my life. I was doing these things, I was sacrificing myself. I was alone. I was alone in the rocks, I was alone in the hills, learning my ways from the plants and the animals. I chose to be a simple man, I chose to be a humble man that lives and walks amongst the people and protects them as a human being. Since then I have learned many things on my own through the power 
of my father to the power of my mother. I have been taught certain things. I have learned different ways that they will never know. To prepare for these becoming these beings, you must first fast for four days and four nights. You must do certain things. You must follow the stars and the moon and the sun to prepare yourself. You must emerge from the water, the, the bloodline of the Mother Earth. The water represents the blood and the life that gives life to all beings, both human beings and animal. You must emerge from the water and you must prepare yourself. You must dress in the way as an animal dresses. You wear the armbands around your arms to represent the forearms of the animal. You wore the leg bands around the legs to represent the legs of the animal. You wore the greens, the evergreens from the forest to represent the spirit of the forest from which you are coming from. You must paint your sail. You must paint yourself with the colors of the water, the color of the mud that comes from the water. You must paint yourself to transform you into the animal. When you paint yourself, you are washing away the flesh and the living of a human being. You wash away the scent of the human being as you cover yourself with the earth. You pray to the Son, our Father. You pray to the earth, our Mother. You pray to the water, our life. You give offerings of prayers. You give offerings of the scents that you burn. And you bless yourself for you have become one with the animal. Once you dress, you must bring the skin to touch your body. And as you cover the self with the skin of the animal, you become the animal. When the elders of these ways have practiced them for years, they become as one with the animal. It will only take a thought to transform them into the being that they have become. Rather than having to go through the whole ceremony, they will be able to transform themselves into the animal just by thought. As if they were walking by down a trail and they thought they would like to become this animal to travel faster. All they would have to do is give an offering to their spirit and they would be able to become this animal. What about other creatures that may exist in these deserts and mountains? Some say certain dinosaurs never went extinct. Some speak of giant snakes and other mysterious anomalies yet to be found. Some say that giant birds still spread shadows across nighttime landscapes. Could there be creatures like these and more that have eluded human detection? 
When you hear a lot of these really strange uh, cryptid stories of giant snakes, even miniature dinosaurs, I've heard stories of, of living pterodactyls and other pterodons, you would think, well, you know, these things have got to be extinct. Uh, mainstream science is telling us uh, that for 65 million years these things have been gone and extinct. However, that doesn't necessarily follow. For example, there's the coelacanth. This giant ancient prehistoric fish uh, was said to have become extinct 85 million years ago. And paleontologists believe that for many years. But it was proven starting in the 1930s that this fish is still alive. And its specimens are still caught every few years and off the coast of South Africa or, or Madagascar. Uh, similarly, giant crocodiles, huge turtles and uh, tortoises, these things too, we know, have been around for 70, 80, 90 million years, according to paleontologists, and they're still alive today. Extinction itself is an anomaly. Every fossil is really an anomalistic thing. But animals don't just die and become fossils. If you bury your pet dog in the backyard, he won't become a fossil. Uh, Buffalo Bill and all his buddies went out and, and slaughtered hundreds of thousands of, of buffalo on the Great Plains of the United States 150 years ago. Not one of those buffalo that they just left there to, after cutting its tongue out and skinning it, not one will become a fossil. And that's because fossils are evidence of cataclysms. To, to become a fossil, something has to be completely buried in a landslide or in volcanic ash or something like that. It can't die normally. It has to be buried in an airtight environment, and then it becomes petrified or becomes a fossil. So fossils themselves are evidence of cataclysms. So it's possible that some dinosaurs and small, weird things that we think are extinct could still be alive, like giant snakes, small dinosaurs, and other weird reptiles. In investigating uh, strange things about the Southwest, it's really interested me the stories of thunderbirds and pterodactyls, a kind of chupacabra-type gargoyle with glowing red eyes and, and bat-like wings. Sometimes these things are reported to be huge. Uh, in the early 1970s, there was a very famous uh, series of incidents uh, along the Texas-Mexico uh, border where a number of people, including school teachers and others, said they witnessed what they described as pterodactyls or, or pterodons flying through the air. And these are part of the Native American traditions called Thunderbirds. It seems incredible that pterodons and some kind of living fossil pterodactyls are flying around the Southwest, but incredibly, they have been reported. And in other parts of uh, North and South America too, including a very famous incident uh, in Alaska in 2002. Where these things can be living, they're nocturnal, they're gonna live in remote mountains and deserts, one area that has been theorized as a home for these living pterodons is the Sierra Madre Occidental in northern Mexico, just over the border uh, from Texas. This area is super remote, and uh, there are very few roads and villages. I mean, and it's as large as uh, many European countries. Uh, pterodons could still be living in this area. One reason that the Southwest has such potential for uh, cryptids and other unknown animals is that the Southwest is, is a vast and diverse area. It's not only desert and, and mountain desert, but it has the largest ponderosa pine forest in the world. It's got forested steep mountains covered with snow and, and ski areas. Uh, there's craggy ravines. There's plenty of wildlife. Uh, all kinds of animals could be living in the Southwest. Investigator Joshua P. Warren shares a truly interesting concept that is gaining ground and worthy of deeper exploration. You know, when you look at the idea of, of shape shifting from the perspective of classical traditional physics, it seems absurd because we think of this happening on a physical level. However, 
If you really look at everything we know about how life functions and about all the energy fields that are around us that are invisible or inaccessible, there is nothing within the realm of our scientific understanding to suggest that life cannot exist within frequencies that are non-physical to us. Physicality is relative. One thing is physical to another if they occupy the same frequency range so that they resist each other. Not so different than two light poles of a magnet pushing apart. And I think that there are other life forms that are non-physical to us for most of the time that do exist and are able to appear to us once in a while dependent upon either our state of mind or the state of the environment that we are in. The idea of a shapeshifter really calls into question what matter is to begin with. Um, I, I tend to think that this idea that we are conscious entities surrounded by an energy field which is in a constant state of flux indicates that this energy field can actually at times under conditions we don't understand take on forms that are non-traditional. I mean our bodies are constantly sort of evolving every moment toward in this case our ultimate death of a physical body. And when you look at these stories about creatures like the Mothman or the Chupacabra or Bigfoot and you talk to people who have seen them, they say this thing looked just as tangible, just as solid as, as another human being does and yet right in the midst of that they vanish or they fly away they do things that obviously go beyond what we think of in terms of what is capable within the realm of traditional physics. So I think that uh, the reason we don't have a Bigfoot or a Chupacabra or a Mothman in a cage in a zoo somewhere is because these are creatures who happen to be right at that boundary between the physical and non-physical frequencies that are capable of slipping back and forth a little closer to our frequency or a little farther away from our frequency depending upon either the perception of the person there or the conditions at the place where they are seen. Because a lot of these creatures have been called harbingers throughout history because people see them just before a disaster happens or something like that. Before there is a massive change in the physical environment, there needs to be a change in the energy environment. And I think that when there is an energy change that is impending, the first stage is that the frequency upon which we perceive things, I mean, look at light, for example, you know, light is this almost intangible thing, yet that is the medium through which we are able to perceive each other visually, that changes first. It allows us to see these creatures and it builds and builds like a charge and a capacitor until it reaches this critical point where finally there's a discharge and you get your earthquake or the silver bridge collapses or whatever. And at that point, a balance is restored and then the creatures are gone. So they don't necessarily cause these changes but they appear because the changes are about to come and the frequencies are distorted. The prospect that there are humans out there, shamans, philosophers, people who understand this and devote their lives to trying to not only perceive things but change the way they are perceived, the prospect that that is something realistic, actually, um, you know, it, it's plausible in the world of quantum mechanics. You go to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, things like that. Uh, it's based on the idea that the observer affects what is observed. And therefore, if we know that the mere act of observing something can change what is being observed, then we can also say that maybe if the observer 
is self-aware of this ability, the observer can change him or herself. Because we have this sort of curse upon us where we are told that we are at the whim of all of these external forces over which we have no control. When people acknowledge that they are not independent, separate beings, that they are a part of this vast ocean of fluctuating frequencies, and they truly embrace that and believe it, then they might actually be able to change the way that other people perceive them because they first change the way that they perceive themselves. Something that is, is, is visually appreciated is just really sort of an illusion to begin with. So when you, you know, talk to people like David Icke, you know, talking about seeing people shapeshift from a reptilian back and forth, he talks about the idea that you know, this is all about the way the observer decodes the information. And um, I, I really do think that if you want to break it down to a simple example, you go into a bar and you know, maybe there's a lady at the bar, one guy says, oh, she's attractive, and the other guy says, no, she's not attractive. What is the difference there? You know, why is it that one person finds this lady attractive and the other person doesn't? They're seeing two different things. That's a subtle example of something that might be magnified and changed and manipulated so that some person might say, I see a flash of a reptilian here, or I see some shape-shifting entity and the other person sees something totally different. So, you know, it, it really boils down to the idea that the information that's being ex ex exchanged between people is malleable. And that can apply both to the fact that we can see each other differently as humans and from time to time we can not only see animals differently but we might see animals or other beings from time to time for a limited temporary period of time. In a nutshell I guess you could say that the first step in the scientific method is observation and that's great if something can be observed several times within a week or a month or a year. But if you have things that can only be observed and, and documented properly every 10 years, every 20 years, every 100 years, every 1,000 years, the scientific method just doesn't hold up because of the human perspective, the human interest. And so therefore, uh, I think what we see now is a merging between looking back thousands of years at the things that shaman and mystics and philosophers were talking about and what we are now learning about quantum physics and seeing how it all can connect together into a larger picture and hopefully that larger picture is going to show us that there is no absolute reality because we are collaborators in this process the observer and the observed are creating this experience via consciousness that will ultimately give us the ability to define how that we as observers can connect with whatever these things are. We visited Apache country and heard strange accounts of Bigfoot in the dense forests of northern New Mexico. We've learned age-old secrets and truths behind one of the Native American people's greatest legends and mysteries. We have discussed the possibility that perhaps many undiscovered creatures prowl the American Southwest and beyond. We've opened a door into new and cutting-edge insights into what paranormal phenomenon of all kinds might be. Perhaps, as is true on many paranormal investigations, we are left with more questions than answers. But as we did discover, perhaps that is the very essence of what mysterious forces are at work in the invisible world of the unknown. We've heard some stories, we've seen some interesting evidence, but the fact is, we just don't know. But as long as there are mysteries out there, in the Southwest, or all over the world, Myself and the World Explorers Club and other people I know 
We'll keep searching for these mystery creatures. I heard the story about the Bigfoot running with two sheep, but nobody was really clear about what he wanted with the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I got mine! Well, we're here out in the middle of nowhere getting our Bigfoot in his Wookiee costume. We're not going to tell anybody it's actually a Chewbacca. <laughs> we, we modified the face, we took off Chewbacca's Fu Man 2, so now it's at least a little more monkey-like. Are you scared yet? Ow, 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 good. It's all good. This is, this is Jeb here. He lied about his height, but I'm going to let him slide. <laughs> he told me he was 6'5 in his ad, and, and I, he gets here yesterday, and I've got, dude, I'm 6'2, and you're not any taller than I am. And he just goes, <laughs> like he just did just now. That's <laughs> good. Okay. I guess it's okay to exaggerate on your resume, but not to that extent. Record. Were those okay, Stu? Okay. Okay, so back up a little bit. <laughs> Try to stop a little closer to him if you can. Okay? Okay, that's good. Okay, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Wait. Yeah, I'll say go. Okay, car. Okay, go, Jed. I didn't see you come out the other side. Let's do it one more time. That was pretty good. We'll do that one more time, just like that, huh? That one more time? Yeah. And you can stop like right there. Okay, this time come out on the other side of the car, okay? Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna say car and then I'll say go. Okay, car. 
and go. And you can just drive real slow. Okay, stop. Go ahead, okay. Here, go ahead and just kind of lean out and wave at me. Stop, stop, hold on. Okay, now go ahead and do that. Okay, one more time. Hold on. Yeah. Okay, that was... Giganticus hedicus, loosely translated into English, means big head. Now normally my friends think that this refers to me, but here, near Kingman, Arizona, something else is truly the case. This is perhaps one of the rare artifacts that connects the heads at Easter Island to the images of the Toltecs. This is the Midwest statue of the nose. It's believed to have connections to Peru also. Notice the big nose suited for snorting cocaine. Now, the Native Americans have a story about this nose. Apparently, it's been here since it predates some of the earliest Native American civilizations to come through here. And it is often referred to as the original green giant. Apparently, the being came up from under a volcano, and when he realized he was near Kingman, Arizona, he got so scared he turned to stone. Now, verifying some of these facts is very, very difficult. Obviously, we have nobody to talk to, and oddly enough, when you actually ask local Native Americans about the origin of the giant green nose, dude, they will not speak of it. Yep. Arizona's one strange place.